So let's go on with the origin of species, which is not really the origin of species, but just like how species change. So um, we should know the biological definition of a species. And that is a group of organisms that can breed and reproduce and produce fertile, fertile, that was viable and fertile in one word, viable fertile offspring. So they can produce offspring that can have other offspring. Um, so here's examples of different species. This is one species, although there's such a great variety of individuals. Any of them could breed, reproduce, and produce fertile offspring. Oh, the eastern and the meadow, western meadowlark. These look alike. They have the same name. Are they a variety like these over here, or are they separate species like these up here? What do you think? They're actually separate species. They have different songs, different behaviors, which would prevent them from breeding with each other. They also have um, obviously Eastern and Western. So um, geographically they're isolated as well. So there's no interbreeding that happens with that group. So they are not a species. So how do we go from one group? So probably like the metal arcs were all one group to begin with. How do we go to the point where they're separate and they are now two different distinct um, species. So we can talk about a couple of different ways this happens and some are allopatric, allo meaning other, and some are sympatric, sem being the same. Um, but one way or the other, usually a, a group of individuals are isolated, whether it's geographical, behavioral, so like the meadowlarks, they don't sing or the same song, so they're not going to attract each other. Um, it could be um, mechanical, so the pieces and parts don't fit together sort of thing, chemical. Um, so they could be geographically isolated, reproductively isolated. So like if you had a barrier here, these um, two organisms are gonna be geographically isolated, right? Because there is a barrier between their ponds that once existed in one pond. Um, it could also be like a canyon, a river, something like that, that keeps individuals from finding each other. So what happens is that like your gene pool gets limited. And so you're only going to be breeding with individuals that are in your gene pool. And so that might just randomly eliminate some of the genes. It's not that there was a mutation necessarily. Um, well, there would have been a mutation in the original population, um, but then because you're isolated, you just no longer have access to that other gene. Um, so if they're isolated, they're going to be evolving independently. So this one here, this would be considered allopatric, allo is other. So this is with a geographic separation. And this is sympatric, sim is the same. So that in the same place, they might evolve to be two separate species. So probably one of the most common examples, and you see this like in lots of different tests throughout the nation, like ACT tests and MME tests and like the freshman PSAT test. I've seen the, the squirrels of the Grand Canyon show up quite often. Um, so they clearly have this physical barrier. They have the Kaibab, the South Kaibab um, squirrel and the Albert squirrel. One is on the North Rim, one is on the South Rim. The canyon is a mile high, a couple miles wide. So when this canyon over time became the big ditch that it is, if you will, <laughs> um, it separated these two um, different groups of squirrels. And so they had their own separate evolutions through time, change in gene pools that occurred on the separate sides of the canyon. And so that would be a good example of an allopatric speciation. So the one squirrel is found only on the south rim and the other squirrel is found only on the north rim. Ecological isolation. 
So this is um, a sympatric version. So they might live in the same region, but they occupy different habitats. And so they rarely encounter each other. So like you'll find lions and, and tigers, right? In different um, habitats. And so over time, their genes were isolated to their own group of individuals. Same thing with the snakes. You can go through the anoles. Anoles live, they're like little lizards and they live in trees, but some are ground dwellers. Some live up in the high br branches and stuff. So they have all different um, miniature. That's a good example that we could get into with ecology. They have like miniature habitats within their ecosystem. And so that isolates them from each other because they just don't walk the same path. And so they don't come across each other basically. So these two species of garter snakes occur in the same area, but one is a water snake and one is the, a land snake. And so obviously they're not going to um, be breeding the lions in the grasslands versus the tigers in the rainforest. Temporal has to do with time. Anytime you see the word temporal, that's related to time. So one could uh, be breeding in the summer and one could be breeding in the winter. So if they're not on the same schedule, they're not going to be sharing each other's genes, right? Could be um, annual too, like the cicadas, they, they don't even breed yearly. So if they're not on the same schedule, they just, they'll, they'll limit their gene pool basically. So species that breed during different times of day, different seasons, different years, they just cannot mix their gametes. And if they're not mixing their gametes, they're isolating genes from the gene pool. So this is considered reproductive isolation and it can happen in the same area. They can be living in the same area. They're just not breeding at the same time. And so that would be sympatric. This is two examples with the skunk. They overlap in their range but one mates in the winter and one mates in the summer. Behavioral. So I've talked about the dance or the nest building or the song, and those are all examples. So the blue-footed boobies mate only after a courtship display unique to their species. So they're not going to be attracting other species. Um, only their own species would appreciate their dance. So that's going to limit the gene pool because you're only going to attract those that are of the same rituals, whether it's the song or make who can make the best nest or your dance. So this is another example of reproductive isolation. So any of these you recognize is going to limit your gene pool. And that's, that's ultimately what, what changes a population. You have mechanical isolation. So morphology is shape. Um, so differences can prevent successful mating. So um, you can look at these plants, for example, and they have to have um, the right shapes to fit the right pollinator. And so there's a co-evolution that exists between different birds or butterflies and, um, and the flowers. So they've evolved together and that they, like different hummingbirds will fit different flowers. Um, so they attract different pollinators. These are monkey flowers. Um, they have different shapes and therefore they cannot cross pollinate. Another example, mechanical isolation has to do with uh, the, the mechanics of the organs themselves, the sex organs. Um, so these are different, Damselfly penises and clearly have different shapes, which are going to only fit certain openings, right? So that's another reproductive isolation. You can get into prezygotic isolation and postzygotic isolation. So remember the zygote is to the egg and the sperm coming together. So that's the fertilized egg. So prezygotic isolation stops the fertilization from happening in the first place. Post-zygotic would happen after the fertilization occurred. So gametic isolation. Um, so the sperm of one species may not fertilize another species. This is kind of like a chemical incompatibility in that you need certain enzymes to break the barrier of the egg for the sperm to, or yeah, for the sperm to be able to get through. 
And so if you don't have the right enzyme, the sperm can't get through, right? So that would be an example of a chemical incompatibility. Um, some post-reproductive barriers. Um, so they prevent hybrid offsprings from developing to a viable fertile adult. So you can maybe cross different species, but if their offspring is not then able to produce fertile offspring as well, or if sometimes the hybrid has a weakened um, viability, ability to survive. So um, if they have that weakness, they're not going to survive. And so those are two things that might isolate after reproduction occurs. So this is an example of um, the hybrid viability. So genes of different parent species may interact and impair the hybrid's development. So each species alone is strong, but the hybrid is not. So the salamander here um, do not compete development. They don't complete development. And so those that, are, that do are often frail. And so they typically have a very short lifespan. Chromosomes of parents may differ in number of structure and meiosis in hybrids may fail to produce normal gametes. So if one species has like 26 and the other one has 27, when they come together, there's gonna to be a mismatch, right? And so the, um, if there's not a pair of every chromosome, you don't have all of the information you need to create a strong viable offspring. So we know of um, <clears throat> the horse and the donkey coming together to make the mule, which is a very strong individual, but is sterile. So a mule can't make more mules. And this is why it has to do with the numbering of the chromosomes. So there's going to be a leftover chromosome um, between the two. The donkey has 62 and the horse has 64. So when they come together, it's like an odd number. So there's not a pairing. Another example of hybrid breakdown is in our rice species. They're vigorous, um, but the next generation will be small and sterile. So it's not gonna be a sustainable species. This can happen over a long period of time or a short, quick period of time, which I mentioned the other day um, when we were talking about the fossil record, we said we could see a gradual change or sometimes there's an abrupt change. So gradual change is gradualism. Here you can see like, you don't really see a big difference between two of these moths, but if you looked over time, the little small differences accumulate and now they seem very different, right? So it took a long time for those to accumulate. Punctuated change happens when all of a sudden there is a change, which often happens when there is like a, geographic change or a disaster, <clears throat> or all of a sudden a habitat is available that wasn't available before. So good to know that evolution, like natural selection, you know, happens at, at the individual, but evolution is happening at the population level. It is not goal oriented. So when we say survival of the fittest, it's not like like how we think of fitness, right? An evolutionary trend does not mean evolution is goal-oriented. It's not headed to a certain place. It's just changing over time. Okay, so we'll talk about succession in an ecosystem, in ecology, which is similar, but there is kind of that goal in that it wants the most stable, and that is not necessarily the case with evolution. So, that's today's topic. Um, do you have any questions on the speciation? It all comes down to DNA and mutations, right? And isolating if they can breed and produce fertile offspring or they can't breed and produce fertile offspring. Okay. So we're gonna get into Heidi Weinberg um, a little bit. And I meant to have a notebook or something, sorry. It's okay. 
things fall. I don't have enough table space for myself. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So um, we're doing Hardy Weinberg, right? So I'm just gonna draw out these. Do I need a darker pen? I'm gonna draw out these equations and just explain them to you. Is this better? P plus Q equals one, right? So this is a frequency. This is referring to like percentages, but frequencies are in decimals. So one is basically 100%. Do I need to focus? Okay. What you want to relate P and Q to is... You want to relate this to um, alleles, right, from genes. So like this is your dominant allele and this is your recessive allele. And if there's only two versions of a gene, it makes sense. They would add up to 100%, right? I got all of my dominants and all of my recessives and they add up to 100%. Is it blurry? Oh, Miss Nutt has bad eyes. Okay. So. This is a single allele. This is one of your equations. So our other one is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. So this is genotype. So these are alleles and these are genotypes. Okay, so two letter combinations. So P squared, if P is capital R, this is basically your big R, big R, homozygous dominant version of the gene. 2PQ, so P is big R, Q is little r, is two times big R, little r. Plus Q squared and Q is little r, so this is R squared. Oops, sorry. This is your homozygous recessive, little r, little r. So you got homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive equals one. And you should recognize that as your one to two to one ratio that you typically get when you have a heterozygous cross. So like if you pictured your squares, right? There's your one and one, and you would typically have two. So all of your genotype versions add up to 100%. So in some questions, they'll talk about the allele frequency. So you're looking at this equation here. And in some cases, they'll talk about a genotype or they'll just talk about um, a trait, like how many in a population. So if a population remains, is, in, is, at, um, is not evolving, so they're remaining stable, you should expect these frequencies to occur generation after generation. So if you knew that the big R, the dominant allele occurred in um, 60% of the time, right? So it has a 0.6 frequency. That means that the little r, the recessive allele would occur in a 0.4 frequency. It's a zero point, I'm being lazy. So this is big R, little r. So that means I could figure out how many within a population by calculating the percentage of the population. So let's look at this first problem together. So I pulled up the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium problem. So frequency of two genes in a gene pool is 0 0.19. So that's your A, which is P, right? And 0 point, I'll go back to sharing screens here. Um, 0 0.81 is your little a, so that's Q. So P plus Q equals one. So if the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, Calculate the percentage of heterozygotes. Since I'm talking genotypes here, that's my P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. So if I need to calculate the heterozygous individuals, I just would calculate two times 
dominant allele times recessive allele. So if I grabbed a calculator, two times 0.19 times 0.81. Oops, ah, Gabriella. I've, it sent it to Gabrielle instead of typing it on my calculator. Two times 0.19 times 0.81 equals. So 0 0.31, if I round it up, would be the percent of heterozygous individuals. And the percentage of homozygous individuals, P squared, if 0 0.09 equals P, I'm just squaring point. One nine, sorry. Would it not be uh, point eight one because it's a little a? Yes, yeah, sorry. Good job, Corbin. Yes, point eight one times point a one because we said homozygous recessive, the little a. So you have point six six. I should have printed this paper out, then I could, okay, get my mouse way over here. Then I could have written on it. At the what was the first one again? Or so um, heterozygous, that's your 2PQ. So you're gonna do two times 0.19 times 0 0.81. P equals, 0 0.19, that's actually a lowercase p, isn't it? And q equals 0 0.81, therefore 2pq equals 2 times 0 0.19 times 0 0.81. Okay, not all, all that's happening is right there. So that's how you would solve this one. So the second one, calculating the percentage of homozygous recessive. So I needed to look at the recessive allele. And I know um, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. Right? So in order to solve for, this is the single allele, this is the genotype. That means I'm going to take 0 0.81 and square it. So what do you think you want to do with number two? Wouldn't you divide um, like 891 by 900? Hang on, I'm going to turn my sound up. So you want to divide what by? A uh, 891 by 900 and 9 by 900. Okay, so you looked at the population as a whole. So that's going to give you the frequency of what? Each color. Okay, and is that an allele or is that a genotype? Uh, that would be like genotype. Which is coded for by an allele or a genotype? Genotype. So which um, equation are you looking at? Uh, the the second one, P2, P squared plus two. Yep, 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 okay. So you would be using this equation here is what you're thinking. Calculate the allelic frequency. So what they're asking for is the allelic frequency, which means I'm looking at P plus Q equals one, right? So 
how are you going to go from something here, like these numbers fit into this equation, how can I go from that to p plus q equals one? Because it's asking me for allele frequency, not genotype frequency. I give up on perfection. What do you think? These numbers, you're right, fit into this equation here. How can I go from that equation to this? Well, the, the, um, all the black ones are going to be homozygous recessive. Uh huh. And then you'd have to just take the 891, set it equal to p squared plus 2pq, I think. There's going to be double. There's going to be double uh, heterozygous versus uh, homozygous dominant for the white sheep. And how are you going to calculate homozygous dominant? You, so you take 891, right? And you'd set it equal to P squared plus 2PQ, I think. And then solve for P. How are you going to solve for P? So I'm thinking that there has to be double. Like, isn't it? So it's one to two to one, like the ratio is. I know, so but you have two variables in that equation. If I took 891 and divided by three, then I can get one to two. I think. So when solving these problems, because your dominant trait, right, can be homozygous or heterozygous, it is best to start with your recessive individuals. Because there is only one genotype that can code for the recessive individual. So if nine out of 900 are black, Let me get a calculator here. Nine out of 900 are black. That's 0 0.01. So percentage, that'd be 1%, right? Okay. The square root of that, because if we solved for the frequency of black, nine out of 100, solve for the frequency of the recessive trait, and we know this allele or this genotype is Q squared. So basically, nine divided by 900 is equal to Q squared, right? Because it would be hard to work with your 891. Oh, I'm still superscripting. Okay, I'm going to go up here. It would be difficult to work with da, 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 da. 891 divided by 900 equals P squared plus 2PQ. Basically, that's what it is, right? Because all of these show the dominant trait. So how do I solve for P and Q in that part of it? Q squared, always start with your recessive alleles. There is only one way to get a recessive trait. So solve for the recessive trait first. So nine divided by 900 is gonna equal Q squared. I wanna know the allele frequency. So I'm gonna take the square root to solve for Q. I don't know how to make a square root sign on my keyboard. Right. So 900 divided by nine and take the square root of that. Oh, not 900 divided by nine. Nine divided by 900 and take the square root of that. So 0 0.1 is the frequency of Q. So now that I've solved for Q, I can plug that in and solve for P. So if P plus Q equals one, one minus Q, 0 0.1 is going to equal P. Therefore, P will equal 0 0.9. Now I've solved for P and I've solved for Q and I can put that into a formula and I would be able to solve for anything, right? But they're asking for the allelic frequency. So they really just wanted to know what does Q equal and what does P equal? Does that make sense? 
So always easiest to start with your recessive allele. So you guys wanna try the next couple and let me know if you have questions. <laughs> 